Welcome to Weekly News Highlights, where we wrap up your week with a glimpse back into what went on in the past week. I'm Kim Dami in Seoul. Let's first look back using keywords. The leaders of South Korea and Japan met in Tokyo this week and agreed to turn the page on years of frictions and move on. The two have refreshed their security cooperation by fully normalizing the military intel sharing pact and closed down their long trade dispute, including Tokyo getting rid of expert curbs on chip materials. This week here on the Korean Peninsula was a wave of provocations by North Korea, including multiple rounds of missile tests. Not only in a show of force against the joint military drills between South Korea and the U.S. this week, but also in an apparent display of discontent over talks on security cooperation that took place during the Yoon Gishida summit, or just taking advantage of those occasions to carry out military activities. Spring in the air, meaning flower festivals are welcoming back visitors. And the annual Seoul Fashion Week is back for its fall and winter edition. President Yoon suk yeol sat down with Prime Minister Fumio Gishida in Tokyo this week. The two countries are now to build ties that look toward the future, based on security and economic cooperation. Let's first turn to our top office correspondent, Oh Soo-young, who traveled with the president. South Korea and Japan took major steps on Thursday to normalize their relations in security and trade and move towards a partnership that looks to the future. Agenda In the joint press conference after their summit, President Yoon Seok Yeol and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said Japan that day had ended its 2019 export curbs on three key materials used in South Korea's major tech products. Yoon said Seoul had also dropped its complaint against Tokyo's export policy to the World Trade Organization. The two neighbors' relations hit a critical low some four years ago over unresolved disputes and sentiments over historical issues, primarily the issue of compensating Koreans who were subjected to forced labor by Japanese firms before and during World War II. Under the strong leadership of President Yoon, I am aware measures were announced to pay the settlements through a Korean foundation. With the implementation of the measures, I expect bilateral ties will progress more vigorously in a wide range of fields such as politics, the economy and culture. To close the book on their trade war, the two sides will continue to hold talks to reinstate each other as trusted trade partners on their respective whitelists. On that note, they have also agreed to revive defence dialogues and establish economic security talks between Seoul and Tokyo, as well as seek trilateral dialogue with China. Another key move was fully restoring the bilateral military intel sharing pact, considered vital in joint efforts to counter North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. This comes as Seoul and Tokyo move to bolster their cooperation with Washington to deter Pyongyang and address growing regional and economic challenges in the Indo-Pacific region. The Yoon Kushida summit is seen as a key stepping stone to such efforts overcoming historical sticking points by building mutual trust, creating the base for greater governmental, business and civilian exchanges. Building on their breakthrough summit on Thursday, both Yoon and Kushida expressed their willingness to engage in active diplomacy, meeting whenever necessary without being constrained by formalities. Oh Soo-young, Young News, Tokyo. Now, these summit talks were not just of interest to Seoul and Tokyo. Foreign media outlets have also shed light on the Yoon Gishida meetup, some seeing it as an opportunity and a new chapter in security cooperation, while others voiced skepticism about potential results. Following the South Korea-Japan summit, news outlets across the globe assessed South Korea and Japan as having opened up a new chapter in bilateral relations amid regional threats from North Korea and China. After the summit, Reuters reported that the remarks from the leaders of the two countries show how North Korea's missile launches and China's expanding engagement globally have contributed to the two countries' mending ties. Germany's DPA also attributed cooperation between the two countries as coming as a result of the challenges posed by North Korea and China. 
France's international news agency AFP provided a recap of past disputes between South Korea and Japan, while also mentioning how President Yoon Song yeol has been working to overcome a century of difficult history and respond to regional crises by cooperating with Japan. It also reported the U.S. appears to have worked intensively to ensure the summit took place, adding that Washington welcomes better South Korea-Japan ties as feuding over historical issues has undermined the U.S. push to reinforce its alliances in Asia. That was also mentioned by some other media outlets in the U.S., which assessed the summit as strengthening trilateral ties between South Korea, the U.S., and Japan. The New York Times highlighted the importance of security ties between Seoul and Tokyo as it says that China's rising ambitions threaten to alter the balance of power in Asia. According to the Washington Post, all eyes are fixed on whether or not disputes arising from the Japanese colonization of the Korean Peninsula during World War II can be resolved. Meanwhile, Japanese media welcomed President Yoon's visit to Japan. NHK provided some biographical information on Yoon while also reporting the popularity of the Japanese animated movie Slam Dunk and the Japanese whiskey highball boom in South Korea. The Yomiuri Shinbun had a similar tone with the meeting among its top stories where it called the first summit in Japan between South Korean and Japanese leaders in 12 years an effort to roll out proactive economic cooperation. On the other hand, Chinese outlets were more skeptical about the potential results. Citing an expert, the state-run newspaper Global Times said it would be difficult to thaw icy bilateral ties between Seoul and Tokyo and that hostility between the two countries may even grow. It also pointed the finger at Washington, adding that President Yoon should aware of satisfying the needs of the U.S. and Japan. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. Top-level diplomacy has also brought high hopes of reviving the much-toned-down cultural exchanges between the two countries. Particularly, South Korea has come a long way in terms of culture and tourism, from the Korean waiver Hallyu enjoying the peak of its popularity in Japan in the early 2000s to disappearing from the Japanese scene due to an anti-Korean movement in Japan over historical and territorial disputes. Let's turn to our Song Yoo-jin for more. With South Korean President Yoon suk yeols visit to Japan and meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on Thursday, all eyes are on whether this can be a turning point for the soured Seoul-Tokyo relations. That includes cultural ties as well. Cultural diplomacy between the two countries kicked off in 1998 after former President Kim Dae-jung and his Japanese counterpart Keizo Obuchi came up with what was called a New Japan-Republic of Korea partnership towards the 21st century. The first Korean wave in Japan started in the early 2000s after the hit Korean drama Winter Sonata aired in Japan. Then in 2010, K-pop rose to the fame thanks to the artists like Kara, TVXQ and Girls' Generation. But ties weaken as relations turn thorny from the early 2010s over historical and territorial disputes. This triggered the anti-Korea and No Japan boycott movements in each country. But the good news is that things have gotten better. During COVID-19, both Koreans and Japanese people started consuming more of each other's content through streaming platforms. The fourth Korean wave in Japan is happening right now, where interest not only lies in K-content, but food, products, tourism and language. The younger generations are leading the wave, whereas during the early 2000s, it was the older generations. And experts predict President Yoon and Prime Minister Kishida's meeting will further boost cultural exchanges. Cultural, interpersonal exchanges depend greatly on bilateral ties. When relations were not good, it was hard for people in Japan to publicly share their interest towards Korean culture. The bilateral summit could help break this atmosphere. The same goes for tourism. Strained ties and COVID-19 cut cross-border interaction between Seoul and Tokyo. But it's been recovering since the second half of last year following the easing of virus protocols such as the resumption of visa-free entry between two countries. School trips and group tours from companies are heavily influenced by diplomatic relations. We are already seeing more school trips from Japan this month. We expect more of these tours to take place after Thursday's summit. All that's left now is for Seoul-Tokyo cultural and tourism exchanges to get back on track. Song Yujin, Arirang News.
North Korea carried out a series of military activities, a widely expected show of discontent over the 11-day joint military drills between Seoul and Washington. The Korean Peninsula woke up to North Korea's report on two cruise missiles fired from the regime's 824 Yongung submarine on Monday. They flew in elliptical and figure of eight-shaped flight orbits for over two hours. Now, the North has fired ballistic missiles from a submarine before, but never cruise missiles until now. It's also alarming that the missiles flew in a diagonal line, meaning the regime could have used launching tubes from their old submarines. Now, that could also mean that their old submarines are capable of firing missiles, not just their newer advanced models. And the second round of missile launches came two days after. This time, two short-range ballistic missiles were fired from Changyang County. The area is just about 150 kilometers away from demilitarized zone and flew across the North's inland area. According to experts, it's the North's way of showing off a stable missile launch to Seoul and Washington while the Allies are engaging in active joint military exercises. And just hours before President Yoon Sagar set off for Japan for his summit with the Japanese counter Fumio Gishira summit on Thursday, there was an intercontinental ballistic missile launched, the Hwasong-17, the regime's largest nuclear-capable missile to date. It was the first time in almost a month that the North fired an ICBM. Overseeing the test firing, the leader Kim Jong-un called for enhancing deterrence against a nuclear war and giving a sense of fear to the North's enemies. So, as you can see, a total of six rounds of ballistic missile launches just here. And we are just three months into the year, staging the launches from usual spots to new locations. Pyongyang is warning that the regime can launch stage launches whenever and wherever. As we just saw, it was yet another bumpy week here on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea ramped up a weapons test in a show of military might this week. Now, what triggered the show of aggression and what do all these missiles mean for peace on the peninsula? Our defense correspondent Kim Yansung, who's been following the regime's latest, is with us today. Welcome, Yansung. Thank you, Tommy. So North Korea lately really has been trying to flaunt its wide range of military might. Now, each weapons test this week has involved a different missile, including what North Korea claims to be a submarine-launched strategic cruise missile, a solid-field ballistic missile, and what's suspected to be the Hwasong-17, the intercontinental ballistic missile. Right, so various types of missiles in just a week. Now, this time, the issue of aggression and belligerence is very much intentional, right? Yes, absolutely. So this week, Seoul and Washington held their biggest joint re uh, drills in years this week, codenamed Freedom Shield. And there was the first bilateral summit in 12 years between the leaders of South Korea and Japan. So there was a lot going on for North Korea to really register as a threat and for them to really harsh up their fiery tone. Right, which we'll get back to in just a moment. But for now, let's walk us through the missiles throughout the week. Let's first start with the summary launched missiles. Right, so South Korea's military detected a fresh round of submarine launched missiles fired from North Korea's east coast. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff described these projectiles that traveled over 600 kilometers as unidentified. But a news report from North Korea's state-led news agency later said the submarine launches were of strategic cruise missiles. Now, the word strategic is used to describe a more formidable weapon that yields more power than what would be called a tactical weapon. And it also hints at the ability to carry a nuclear warhead. And this is especially noteworthy because if North Korea's reports are true, this would be the first success case of North Korea's submarine-launched strategic cruise missile, which shows their advances in firearms. Right, and the submarine-launched missiles are especially more challenging to, to, to detect. And it wasn't just submarine-launched missiles. North Korea also fired short-range ballistic missiles. Let's talk about that. Right, the KN-23. Uh, the photos suggest that these missiles 
could be the KN-23, which is a solid fueled short range ballistic missile. And this one is a tactical guided weapon, but it's solid fueled, which means it's easier to launch quickly. And it's also designed to fire uh, to fly at a lower trajectory. So it has a shorter flight time and it's upgraded to perform maneuvers to avoid interception. So it's also harder to track. This time, North Korea also traveled a little farther down south to test this weapon than from where they usually test weapons. So experts say that this means that they were trying to send a bigger warning to South Korea. Right, and we cannot not talk about the intercontinental ballistic missile. The North claims it to be the Hwasong-17, the most formidable missile involved in this week's weapons test. Please talk about that. Right, absolutely. So traveling about 1,000 kilometers to the East Sea, the missile flew at a maximum altitude of 6,000 kilometers after being shot at a high angle. Uh, reports say that it landed around 250 kilometers west of Japan's Oshima Island in Hokkaido Prefecture. Analysis of the flight data suggests, and the, according to the state-led news agency, Korean Central News Agency this morning, uh, this could have been an intercontinental ballistic missile, likely the Hwasong-17. And this would mark North Korea's seventh successful ICBM launch since 2017. Right. According to the Japanese defense minister, the Hwasong-17 missile can reach the U.S. mainland if fired from a normal angle, right? Right. It has a potential range of 15,000 kilometers. And South Korea's JCS said that intelligence agents are working closely with U.S. counterparts to investigate North Korea's claims and their actual military might. Okay, the Yeonseng, then the question is, till when is North Korea gearing up its weapons test from missile launches and missile launches in various types and also from various locations? Right, so experts say that uh, North Korea's threats could continue most likely throughout the Freedom Shield. So until next Thursday, I'm going to be on standby next week as well. So to our viewers, stay tuned to Arirang News. Professor Pa gong a leading expert in North Korean studies at Ihua University, said that this situation is nothing new. It's reminiscent of 2017, and North Korea stepped up its weapons test back then and really tried to show off its ICBM developments uh, when former U.S. President Do Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un both ratcheted up their fiery rhetoric. And also judging from the past patterns, North Korea tends to act out when it's struggling internally and really, it's not doing well, especially with the North Korea's economy. So it's expected for North Korea to roll out more of their firearms tests in the coming days. Also this week, North Korea was not too happy about this whole Tokyo bilateral summit that happened for the first time in 12 years. Experts say that the regime would have seen this as a great threat, which is most likely the reason why that North Korea rolled out its ICBM test on this day. And if the trilateral ties between South Korea, the U.S., and Japan are strengthened, North Korea's leadership could feel very backed into a corner. Right. You said Thursday until the North will continue to launch its military activities, but who knows what's in hands of the leader, Kim Jong-un. Now, yeon how are senior Korean, uh, South Korean officials and the international community reacting to the North's latest provocations? Well, tell me, as you can imagine, not too happily, uh, National Security Advisor Kim Song un held an emergency standing committee with key players, including President Yoon Seok Yeol on Thursday. President Yoon said at this meeting that North Korea's reckless threats will have clear repercussions and called on the allies to step up their joint drills. The Indo-Pacific Command highlighted the destabilizing impact of Pyongyang's weapons program and consulted its allies about the problem. And the U.S. State Department Press Secretary Ned Price also called on North Korea to stop these threats and engage in dialogue. Right, lots of developments here on the Korean Peninsula this week and more to come in the coming week. Absolutely, Dami. All right, so do keep us posted next week as well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. One of the most popular festivals here in the country that lets you know that spring is here is finally back. It's the Gwangyang Mehua Festival. The return of the event has been welcomed by its many visitors after three years of hiatus due to the pandemic. White, pink and red mehua flowers decorate the mountains. 
Visitors head to the Gwangyang Mehua village in Gwangyang City, Jeollanam-do province every March to see the plum blossoms. The festival, a must-visit for flower lovers, came back bigger than ever after the pandemic. This weekend alone, some 170,000 people visited this village. For many people in South Korea, these mehwa flowers or plum blossoms represent spring. And with this festival being held for the first time in four years, tens of thousands of people from all over the place have come here to enjoy the spring. I think this festival is beautiful. Like I've never seen so many mehwa flowers because we don't really have many in the United States. So being here and seeing so many and having a beautiful day, it's just been like a really great experience so far. Yeah, we always want to like uh, come to this countryside um, because we've been like around the city area. Um, but it's just so beautiful, like the river and the weather's been really nice today. And the flowers so. smell amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was a bit exhausted from all the traffic, but when I actually got here and saw the flowers, they were much more magnificent than what I imagined. This is the first family trip in a while, so it's been such a great day. I also had a great day. The mehua flowers haven't just brought smiles to the visitors. Faces of local vendors also lit up with orders pouring in for the first time in four years. Visitors can enjoy plum-flavored candy and ice cream and also buy other products to take back home, like mehua flower seedlings and gochujang made with plums. The city officials say the entire city is basically a festival site as anywhere people go, there will be mehua flowers in one way or another. The festival runs until Sunday, March 19th, when the flowers begin to fall. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News, Gwangyang. And it's not just flowers that are signaling the return of springtime. A lighter outerwear and brighter colors are back in closets and stores. And so is Seoul Fashion Week for its fall edition and also the biggest event ever. Our Song Yujin went to check it out. Dongdaemun, one of the biggest and busiest shopping hubs in South Korea, transforms into a runway. It's the 2023 fall winter Seoul Fashion Week. Every March and October, Seoul hosts its own fashion week for designers, celebrities, or just anyone with a passion for fashion. Here at the Dongdaemun Design Plaza is South Korea's biggest fashion extravaganza, Seoul Fashion Week. Now, this year's show is the largest since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, with around 30 Korean designers showcasing their works for the upcoming fall and winter season. The event offers the best of both worlds, from young, up-and-coming brands to established high-end labels. Lai is a modern woman's lifestyle brand known for its bold colors and signature mix-and-match style. And it's taking over the fashion world with appearances at Paris and New York Fashion Weeks. Lai's FW collection this year is all about plur, peace, love, unity, and respect. We're going through a tough time, so I think plur is what we really need. We picked fabrics and colors that could convey these values and collaborated with the teddy bear museum. Singer Pada and her daughter stole the show, taking to the catwalk together for the event's opener. It's my first time walking the catwalk with my daughter. It's an unforgettable experience, but I also want to give a shout out to all the kids and their hardworking moms out there. And one brand you cannot leave out when talking about K fashion, Miss G Collection. Founded in 1979 by veteran designer Ji Chuni, it's famous for its meticulous tailoring and top-notch fabrics. G's collection centers around evoking warm feelings of love through fitted waists, exaggerated shoulders, and abundant volume based on neutral colors. COVID-19 forced us to do shows online, so it's our first time meeting the audience face to face. I'm a bit nervous and thrilled at the same time. Back outside, there are pop-up stores like this one where visitors can capture their Fashion Week experience. You can take pictures from unique angles inside our photo booth filled with mirrors. So if you're wondering what to wear this fall and winter, Seoul Fashion Week's got your back. Song Yujin, Arirang News.
That is all we have for you this week. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.